weekly Q&A show where we answer submitted questions live on YouTube on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Well, happy Tuesday and welcome to our Tuesday Q&A show. And I'm joined here by Rescue Randy. Rescue Randy. Do I just call you Rescue? Can I call you Randy? Or you can call, call me Rescue Randy. Randy? Okay. You can just call me Randy. That's fine. Who I don't even know who wanted to join the show. And so, Randy, tell me about yourself. Like, where are you from? What do you do? Why are you here? Yeah. Um, Long time raft guide, mostly paddle rafting. I've done a lot of oar trips too, but um, I work for a company in Colorado. We've got about 100 raft guides. Um, I did about 20 years as just a guide doing Colorado, doing West Virginia, and now I'm kind of an administrative role for my raft company. I'm an efficiency manager. So I'm the guy that helps with the payroll and the transportation plan and the guide hiring and the guide scheduling and a bunch of stuff for three different river outposts. So deep in the industry, love to geek out on the gear, love the show. So I'm stoked to be here and participate today. Yeah, thank you. And I have one question for you, and we'll get to questions. When did you stop guiding and move into administrative? So last season was the first season I didn't guide. Um, mm-hmm. I, I took a job in our sales team. We're a big enough company that we have you know, sales agents and supervisors mm-hmm. that work year-round. Uh, so I went and worked remote for a year and sold my house in Colorado and traveled and lived in Airbnbs and got a paddle in White Salmon and then Montana and all these cool places. And so I'm, uh, I'm back in Colorado now, uh, kind of helping run the raft company. But um, yeah, this will be my second season to not be a full-time guide. Um, I ca- call this my 20th season, though. I will guide some boats. <laughs> Yeah. Was it hard to transition from guiding to not guiding? Is it like being a full-time guide to all of a sudden, like not being on the water that much? You know, I hurt my shoulder. I had kind of a hard season oh, okay. two seasons ago and I was feeling pretty beat up from it. There was a lot of the last half of the season that I was injured and I'd work one half day trip a day and I'd be sore and could, I'd have to go home. And like, it was just, yeah. it was kind of a rough year for a guy in his forties. And um, so it, it kind of opened my eyes. Yeah. I've, I've been in management at raft companies before here in Colorado and in West Virginia. So I I had a sense of having that passion. I just needed the right kick in the pants to kind of (laughs) find the dust job. I always said when I'm older, I'll, I'll sit. And I think I'm old enough to sit now. Yeah, I'm with you. I I like being on the water for sure, but there's a, it's nice to have a balance. I've Um, private voted more this year than in many years too. And so that's, that's been a huge fun part of it. Sweet. So we're going to power through. We have a bunch of questions from uh, people who watch the show and just other people and we'll get through those, and at the end, we'll just chat about other stuff, which I think you have some things you want to talk about, and we'll just cool. go into conversation when the show's over. So the first question is, I have a 14-foot high side that I'm trying to set up a frame for and want to do it right off the bat. I plan this on a dry box with a, dry box with a Paco over it, not to be up too high. I plan on running 9.5-foot oars, but I will measure once I get a frame. I'm curious what size NRS or tower should I get, or is there a better brand or towers than NRS? So uh, the quick answer on this is uh, if you have an NRS frame, right now there's only NRS ore towers. So if you have that exact diameter of NRS tubing, all I know of is NRS ore towers. That's, that's your option. Uh, and, and NRS ore towers don't work with other things. So it depends on your frame on which one the best ore towers are. The NRS ore towers are nice because they, they're adjustable. You can, they're very adjustable, and you can move them in so you can stack rafts. I think some other ore towers are maybe better for other reasons, like they're more durable and more, you know, they, they don't bend when the boat flips and hits rocks. Anyway, uh, if you have NRS ore towers, I'm going to say eight inch ore towers. Shorter is tough. Don't go longer because then they splay out too far and that's bad for a few reasons. So my answer is get the eight inch ore towers and design everything around that. Anything to add, Rescue Randy? I like that. I don't love the NRS or towers. I have had them hit a rock wall or just get banged around in transit mm-hmm. and even tighten down. They, they bend out. So you have to have that tool on you. Yep. Um, I'm a huge fan of the DRE or towers. I really like their rainbow towers. They can still yeah. slide forward and back if you rig them right. Uh, if you have extra holes, um, but those you can fold in for stacking as well. Um, I do have an NRS Longhorn that I love. Um, well, I say I love it. I just bought it for my Max 12, and it's just because it's collapsible. I travel. I can throw it in the back of the van. It, it breaks down really small, um, but I will definitely have that tool in my PFD. So, you know, for the for the guy that gets a good price on NRS, I think it's a, a great thing to have. 
Um, but if you guys have, uh, you know, the means to get a downriver equipment frame or, you know, one of these other manufacturers, there is a little stouter stuff out there. Um, Ron, the owner of River Boat Works in Colorado, told me once he's been against the wall in the Grand twice. And one was an NRS frame that came apart and one was a DRE frame that didn't. And, and I don't forget that. So um, it's all about quality. I think for smaller boats, you don't need as much power or pressure in the attachment points. And so I think a, a Longhorn for a small 12 foot boat or something is a great choice for a day frame. If you're gonna buy something with multiple bays, you might as well get something with a beefier tower. I like eight inch towers um, for this particular boat. I got the NRS six inch towers because I'm five foot seven and I like to row a little bit lower. And so for me, I felt like oars were closer to my face over the years. So I'm, I'm gonna be mm -hmm. trying out those six inch towers this year. Yeah, I think the reason people don't have six inch towers is because they're people are sitting higher and higher these days. Yeah. Right, they have their dry bag and they have their seat mount and their seat or they have a big pocket pad. And so they're sitting four to 10 inches above the frame, which is not good. So if you're sitting low, the six inches work, but if you're not sitting super low and you need an eight inch tower, this is the eight inch tower, any longer of a tower and it's out farther as well. Yeah. Which requires really long oars and could extend beyond your raft. So the 10 inches that NRS makes are problematic. Yeah. Sometimes they're a good salute. Oh, sorry. I wouldn't recommend this tennis to anybody though, because there's what they need to solve. They need to sit lower. They don't need larger towers. And when the boat flips, the 10 inch tower is more likely to bend over or there's, it's a bigger lever arm under, or if you're rowing really hard, it's more likely to bend in or out. So yeah, if you have a little bit of an undersized frame or if you've bought used oars that are six inches too long or you're solving a problem on a budget, sometimes a taller tower more spread out can work, um, but it's, it's not optimal. It creates more problems. Like it just, yeah. you go down a path of more and more problems. So I would, I would never go 10 inch. I would solve the problem with eight inches. This yeah. is the tool you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't like that. It looks like a, a dangerous tool. So I carry a little yeah. ratchet. It might be FD. You can like stab better. people. I, I've yeah. always like, like I've been using it this month a bunch because I, ha I have a ratchet I carry with me a lot too. But sometimes I end up using this and when their hands are cold and they're trying to really pull it tight, it's easy to like, like I always remember to cut myself with this thing. It's got like a couple of ways to stab yourself. Yeah. It looks kind of so, dangerous to me and I'm I don't not want a it in a watershed. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Yeah. I'm not a fan of this tool, but I, I carry my PFD a lot because it's, it's minimal to do a quick tightening. Yep. Uh, but um, I, and I prefer having a socket in my PFD. Uh, of course, that's just what I'm teaching. I wouldn't recommend that for most people because it just weights down your PFD. Sometimes people have one frame for two size boats. The larger ore towers are a solution for that. Matt, I would not go with a 10 inches. For, I, I'm going to say don't go with 10 inches for any reason whatsoever solve the problem a different way. They, they start creating problems. That's, that's my opinion. Matt, when are you going to come to Colorado and paddle with my ducky crew? I'm going to try um, your boats. All right, let's go. Uh, next is, hopefully that we answer that question. What type of oar blade do you like for all around boating, floating or sinking? Why wood or plastic? Does the shape matter? Uh, I'm a fan of the Sawyer Dynalite oar blades. They're carbon. I think ore blades should float. You, you don't want oars or or blades that sink. So I think floating, because if it comes off, you don't want to lose it. Um, wood or why wood or plastic? Wood is more durable if you're hitting rocks a lot. Like on the Tuolumne River in California, we were just bashing rocks. I would go wood. Plastic is cheap. That's why I'd go with plastic. Um and yeah, the shape matters. That's, that's a pretty vague question. Um, I, I, all I'm going to say is that the Sawyer Dynalites get and get them with the extra wrap, get the extra duty Dynalites are in my mind, perfect. And any, any, anything close to that is close to perfection. That's my opinion. The Dynalite blade is the way to go. You got anything on this one, Randy? I'm, I'm a fan of wooden oars. All of my paddles and oars are wooden, and I'm kind of a collector of artisan stuff. Um, the wooden oars just have that feel that I'm looking for. They've got the little bit of natural flex. They're nice and warm in your hands or a little warmer in your hands. Um, I don't like having a separate blade and shaft because I've seen a fail point there a lot. Um, those really heavy duty Sawyers you're buying, I think are probably the best bet for that if you're going to detach. And some people have a certain length vehicle or some logistical reason, but um, wooden oars are harder to find these days. Uh, there's a builder out of Buena Vista that I bought a, a set of three from recently, Jack Sense and uh, 
They were 350 a stick, so not bad for some ash ores. They're not super fancy laminates, and they're a little heavier than the composites, but I'm pretty stoked to get them on the water, and I trust they'll hold. Have you ever used composites? I, I have. I have. You know, I, I grew up with Carlisle's and, and that kind of thing. I owned cataracts myself and, and have used those a little bit, um, and I've used them at work over the years, you know, probably the whole range of products. Uh, but personally, I just – I like the look, the feel, the wooden oars. It's a look. I, so I was a wooden ore guy forever. That's why I ran for years and years and years. And I was hesitant. And now that I switched, I'm just, I can't go back. Cause it's, I, I like that they separate myself. Cause if you break yeah. an ore, you only broke half of it. Right. So like break into what ore it's broken. Like if you break right. a, a, a blade, you replace the blade. So like your stuff will last longer. Um, they sometimes do give a little bit of the attachment point, but on the dine lights, I've never had a problem. Um, as long as you keep them tight and pay attention to them. Yeah. So like, I, I think there's a nostalgia with wood, but if you switched, you'd be, you have to give it some time. I think you would change your mind. I may have to, I've just got some new wooden doors, so I'm going to give them a shot. Um, but uh, wooden paddles are my jam. I don't think there's anything that competes with the, uh, the fine wooden paddles from Appalachia that I, that I love so much. Yeah. I have a wooden, I have a wooden kayak paddle. I use a lot. Um, it's heavier than my, my regular burner paddle well, for kayaking. I have a wooden, I have a wooden kayak paddle and I have a wooden wrap paddle. And I, I like the wooden wrap paddle because I can beat on it pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. They're more durable than, than yeah. anything else. And you can refinish them. So, you know, if you care for yep. them, they last forever. Who, who built those? It was Kenny. He, Oh yeah. Kenny's a friend. Yeah. Yeah. He's a Colorado yeah. guy who lives here now. I got like a, but back when Kenny was making paddles, I got him to make me a bench shaft. And then yeah. we actually have some wood oars Kenny made some beautiful, what ores that are amazing that I don't even like go out on trips anymore. Cause they're, I love them too much. Like they just, they're kind of artifacts, but that was the end of us. What ores caught like buying 11 foot wood ore now is so expensive and they're so hard it to is. find. It like, is. I'm, if you could get the gulls or something, you know, they, they, those were pretty economical, but it, they're hard to get in the U S anymore, but e economical, then they they're not, don't last as long. Like I was a yeah. fan of the clavy ores, but um, I think, Man, nowadays I can't imagine. The only reason I would run wood personally is like super shallow rivers where you're bashing rocks all the time. Yeah, I think that's pretty hard on carbon. Like that, I worked in the Tuolumne River in California, and we used to just beat on rocks, like push off rocks, smashing into rocks all the time. I think the wood handles that better. Yeah, yeah, but, um, I think so. I don't. know. I think you dig it. Matt likes the cataract magnums. That's insanity. That's just insanity. <laughs> Maybe because, yeah, that's it. I don't know if I agree with that at all. I I am, I mean, I'm a Sawyer ambassador, so I'm supposed to say nice things about Sawyer. But I am 100%. Like, the Sawyer MXGs with the Dine Light Blades and just get extra duty everything. You can't, you can't beat those for all, for price, durability, or performance. That, in my opinion, those should be the only whitewater ore sold. <laughs> everything else is inferior. But I'll have to try some. They're, they're they're not that different from wood. They have a tiny bit of flex. Um, I'm not a fan of flex myself anyway. I like the stiff ore, but they do have a tiny bit of flex. Um, yeah, you'd like them. Yeah, they may flex more than say those Kenny Kylie ores. I've used his ores um, in West Virginia that he made, and they were fairly stiff. I, it really depends on the wood selection and yeah. how beefy they are. They're not always super flexy. It's it's almost not what people expect when they talk about wooden oars. You picture this noodly, like super flexy thing. Often they're fairly stiff. I like stiff, like I, because oh. you lose energy when the when the oar bends. And some people like yeah. to row and have that like that buildup of energy where it kind of releases at once. I want to put the oar in the water and have it immediately react. Yeah, I don't want to have it just like take. I don't have to to load it. Yeah. Um, if I had bad shoulders, I would want a little bit of flex. I think that's a reason to have flex, but I'm a, I want, I actually want them as stiff as I can get them. So when I get my Sawyer MXGs, I say put extra carbon on them, make them even stiffer and more durable. Cool. But um, yeah. Okay. Let's move on. What kind of ammo cans do you use on your rafts? The green and white ones I see in your videos. I don't know. Uh, the kind in our videos, green and white. So the, and, the standard the the rocket box what is that 20 mil well we have it depends the ones this big are those 20 mil cans like they're just the ones people you guys use for like carrying their personal stuff oh the dangerous thing that people strap to the sideboards <laughs> yeah um i mean it's been like a staple for multi-day guides forever to carry these um oh, yeah 
I'm just googling rafting ammo cans. Um, they're called. They're actually. I'll bring this up here. Um, yeah, this is. So this is this is even a narrow one, but it's the, about this size. Oh, here we go. That's a better picture. This. So this is the traditional one that like guides would carry their stuff in. Um, we still use it on our trips. We don't like, I, I agree with you. Like a small metal box is kind of a ridiculous thing to have on a river trip. Um, but we'll put like a, the library in there, like what we'll books in there. We'll pull out for people to read in camp or what else do we use them for? We put a lighter fluid in one with a lighter to light fires. Like they, they're nice little things that carry stuff. This is just the classic one. And then there's the next bigger one, which is a, called a rocket box. That is, uh, let me get bigger again. That's like this big and that tall. And I, I would just Google like rocket box. Hold on. Those fit the eco safe toilets. That's why a lot of people. Yeah. Box. Right. And, and they, they're like, these ones right here, the 20 mil yeah. rocket box. Yeah. Are they in a lot stock? Of, those can be hard to find. Uh, it looks like it. Cool. I mean, a lot of the rafting world. Oh, can you see this? Mm -hmm. I, I this? see the, the list. Oh, I see it. Made it. Oh, let me, hold on, let me go to here. So, a lot of the rafting um, gear has been built around this box. This is like kind of the, the OG dry box before dry boxes were made. And so, like, yeah, certain toilets are made around this box. We use this for ash on our trips. We save our ash. Like, we burn it, make a fire, put our ash in here. And then we get to camp, we just put it back in the fire and we burn it. And so this is where we move ash through our trips. We don't use these very much anymore. But I just did a Grand Canyon trip, and this was used for like almost everything. And frame sizes are built around these, these boxes, actually. So, we use them at our outfitter because they fit the partner stove perfectly. And I'd yeah. rather just take a beating than the partner stove. We run paddle trips, and I don't love these in the in the raft sure. you, we kind of wrap a pfd around them and stuff like that but they still they're the best solution for the partner stove that slides into it perfectly yeah i mean that's there's a certain size of partner stove that's probably made based on this box i mean a lot of rafting gear is made around this box we yeah. just don't we just don't know it and like in a multi-day setup you'll have a hatch in front of you with like historically like four or five of these across with a table on top so they're just like hidden away from things or they're on like a decking next to you with like tied down so i know we use don't use as many of these uh on our trips but getting back to the question like there is a particular box that we have that we use for our food that you may see i don't are they green and wait what color green white ones it might be the ones they're talking about and those ones are they don't make anymore they're from like world war ii they're they're like gold to me like i you won't buy those anywhere they're they're not for sale. If I if you found some, I would buy them in a heartbeat. So I think maybe the ones you're talking about, the bigger ones, they're even bigger than the rocket box. We have a bunch of them, but they don't exist anymore. Uh, let's get to some of Matt's comments here um, on the blades. Yeah, the sh that's the thing I like about the Magnums is they get those shark bites out of them. They The Magnum blades break a lot. Randy, have you used those blades? Do you know what I'm talking about? The Magnum? I, I have, and I, I kind of like the shape of them, but I, I haven't used them enough to see them deteriorate. You could probably put a Dynell strip around the edge like the Sawyer yeah. product, you know, if you had that stuff or wanted to modify something you already yeah. own. Yeah. So, I I mean, the Magnus, that's why I see a lot of them, they have a shark bite missing. Same thing with the plastic ones. They're, they're missing, like, a piece of the thing. Um, well, yeah, of course, Matt, you got to pay more for things. They're twice the price. They probably last three times as long. So in terms of cost efficiency, the diamond lights are going to be better. Like that's just like, they're just going to last longer than, but way longer than the, the, the ones. And I don't like the Duramax either. Like Duramax is an inexpensive solution. I bet you would, a, a dying light blade lasts three times as long as a Duramax too. Like I don't, I don't buy Duramax for the same reason I don't buy the Magnums. Shark baits. No, they, <laughs> no, they don't. I disagree. All right. So let's move on. Questions, questions, questions. So I'm plowing through all these questions because I'm excited to just chat at the end. Okay. What are the guidelines for when to blow your whistle? Emergency only, or is it okay to 
get another boat's attention? Are there any agreed upon whistle signals to be used? I think 80% of the boating community is going to agree with what I say right now. And the other 20%, I, I don't know. The other 20% live in another world. And hopefully, Randy, you're on my side. You're res- you are rescue Randy. So like the fact that you are rescue, you your opinion has extra validity because rescue is in your name. <laughs> One whistle blast means attention. It generally means look at the person blowing the whistle because they're gonna they're gonna point something out. So if there's a swimmer that you want to you want people to know about, a whistle blast like attention, look for a swimmer or look to the person who whistled so they can direct you to where the swimmer is. So I'm gonna say one whistle blast is attention, three whistle blast is serious emergency. Not like serious emergency is like threat to life. And so it's rarely ever used. What do you got? You got anything else on that, Rescue Randy? I would say the same. Um, one whistle blast is heads up, three is emergency, and two is just confusing is the way I learned it. Two is um, very confusing. The three should be long and spaced out, um, not just tweet, tweet, tweet. Um, you know, the other signal is, is 10 blasts, you know, repeatedly, and that's just like fun carnage, right? Um, but one and three are kind of the standards for, for things. I think one is okay if you just want to get someone's attention to point to shore where you want to scout or some kind of communication that doesn't mm-hmm. have to be any kind of emergency. It's just heads up. Um, but three long, conti- you know, long blasts with a decent little space in between them is everybody should be stopping what they're doing and looking for that emergency. Yeah, I wouldn't do the 10 myself because I, I don't want like – I want this simple, one and three. Yeah. And when you hear a whistle, it should get your attention. If you start blowing whistles for other things and you start – it's like the boy who cried wolf. You don't want to like, oh, someone's just blowing a whistle again. you know. So I'm going to use whistles sparingly. Like if I can get their attention without blowing a whistle to scout, I will. But if somebody's starting to come down and you're, they're, they're not scouting and I need them to get their attention. If I need to get their attention to scout, I'll get their attention – with a whistle blast. Yeah, I, I like the tweet, 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 tweet at, at Sweets Falls when you're having lunch because it tells you someone's about to hit the ejector rock or something like that. Certain places where it's kind of a carnival atmosphere. I imagine there's a little bit of that yeah. lock saw. Um, maybe that's not the best safety practice, practice but that's why I say bla- like a lot of little blasts, you know, is kind of the fun blast. I have a friend who carries a different kind of whistle on his GFD that's like the comic like woo sound, and that's kind of a fun one. Oh, blast. interesting. <laughs> We've been doing a lot of re- scenarios in our classes the past month. And people learn, like, we can have this conversation now about whistle blast, but when you're actually out there, whistles aren't as effective as you want, as effective as you want them to be. They're not that loud. And so commonly we'll end a scenario and somebody's like, Hey, I thought you, why don't you pay attention to my whistle? And everybody's like, we didn't hear it. Yeah. And so I think keeping with signals simple is really important. And, you know, one is attention, three is emergency. Anything else to me? can be misconstrued, which we, we wouldn't want out there. Right, and, and I think having a consistent sound to the whistle, I really don't like the choo-choo train whistles I'm starting to see some of my guides show up with. Um, yeah. Some of them boast that they've got more volume than the Fox 40, but they sound different, and our ears aren't trained to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I just think consistency with the whistles is so important. Uh, let's go back to here. There's actually some new Fox. So we all met the Fox 40. There's also the Fox 40... Sonic Blast. So there's new Fox 40 whistles that are louder. So there's a Sonic Blast, and then there's another one they just came out with that I, I we're trying out. It's even better. Oh, here's the Fox 40 website. So this one's louder than the traditional Fox 40. And then there's another one that's even louder, if I can find it. Anyway, looking at some different Fox 40 whistles uh, and finding some better ones. It's also here we go whistles. Electronic. Ooh. Weird. What's that? Titan. Oh, here the epic. So this one I just got. The epic is even even louder. So maybe not getting different noises, but getting newer ones that are even louder, I think could be helpful. I like that cushion mouth grip. That's a nice yep. three dollar upgrade. Yep. Yeah, and it's only like literally, it's like eight ninety five instead of six ninety five. Yeah, I, I own a couple. I have one on each of my PFDs. I've got one in my rescue bag. You know, it's kind of nice to just have those. Yep. All right, let's move on. I plan on riding my bike from Lake Tahoe to the Ro- to Rome, which is the pit of the Oahe, mid-May. I will strap my bike and camping gear on my pack raft and paddle with Leslie Gulch. Where can I find current detailed river maps of this section and the conditions? Um, let's go back to the website. 
and let's Google Oahe River map, and I'll add rafting to the end and see what we find. Um, it didn't come up first, but if you go to this, this is a website that we have, White Order Guidebook, and go to the bottom, there is a link to BLM Oahe River map. So this is the official map. You can't buy this printed. Like they, they have sold it in the past. You can't really find it now. But this is the PDF of all the Oahe and the Jarbage and the Bruno. And it's a lot of pages long. You just need like, I think you just need like eight of these pages for the lower Oahe. So this is where you're going to find a map of the Oahe. For current conditions, I, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Um, I, I did know. the message boards. I'd go to somewhere like yeah. well, Whitewater Guidebook or Mountain Buzz and see what other people, you know, there's a yeah. lot of Oregon voters at both places. Is there not a Martin and Wittes book for the mm -hmm. Oahe yet? I'm surprised. No, I mean, it's, I think they only do books for how rivers that are popular. I mean, they're yeah. always popular for like a month of the year. Right. On years, there's water. So um, there's not. And so, yeah, I mean, conditions, I don't know, ask people on Facebook um find a go to mountain buzz maybe somebody will tell you but that's the map and then also with your experience and expertise of the area how intense do you think this section will be the end of may of this year so um i on the oahe never predict flows or weather ever i can't tell you what the conditions will be i can't predict the future if we're talking about the rogue i can tell you yeah it's gonna be maybe sunny and it won't it probably won't be flooding on the Oahe, I can't tell you, I, I can't predict the future in any way whatsoever. And I won't even try anymore. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but check this out. We launched a commercial trip on the Oahe this morning. Let me see. And the flow, the flow, I, the Oahe is something I've never been able to like ever try to predict. Right. We packed for our trip on April 8th. You look at the thing. It was 1,000 CFS. We launched our trip this morning at 9,000 CFS. Nobody saw this coming. I, I don't think it was like the weather didn't change that much. It didn't rain. The Oahe is completely unpredictable, in my opinion. There's just no rhyme or reason to it. So I... I and maybe somebody else understands it better than I do. I don't understand the Oahe, so I don't even try to predict it. Is it all native flow? Is it rain yeah. and snow melt mixed? Yeah. Cool. It's insane. This place is insane. We launched a trip this morning at like 9,000 CFS. Last year, we launched a trip at 500 CFS in the snow. Like, I, I, I don't even, I can't predict, the, I can't predict that place. And I don't even try. So unfortunately, person who has this question... I cannot tell you what's going to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, much less the end of May. So I hope that's that's all I got. Maybe anticipate as intense as it could be. You know, ask people for their Hawaii horror stories or or the craziest times they've ever seen or the hardest flows they've seen. And make sure you're up for that. Yeah, if you want predictable, go to the rogue. If you want unpredictable, if you need if you need to know in advance what the weather or water flows are going to be you should go somewhere else. Like it's just, just not the right river, river for that. How far a bike ride is it from Tahoe to Rome? Uh, far. That's yeah. Cool. Um, let's look back here. So we'll go Rome, Oregon. So this is the middle of nowhere, Oregon. And we'll get directions from, let's say Truckee. My guess is, is this like 400 miles, 339 miles. It's a five hour drive. Cool. Oh, it says one oh, yeah, day on a choose. 28, 28 hours on a bike. Whew. Through like the Nevada desert where yeah, it's like that's a I think the mat the bike ride is sounds really cool and unique. But the Hawaii, unfortunately you can't you can't predict it. You can't make your plans. That that river will not do what you think. 
you can see my new shuttle rig in the background. I never thought I'd do it, but electric mountain bike. Uh, I like to go <laughs> on, on easier whitewater in the mornings yeah. before work. And I, it's just going to be part of my routine. I'm probably not going to do a six, eight mile bike ride every morning, but I might go ducky a lot more if, if I have that. So it's, yeah. I ignored everything anyone, any of my friends was saying, and I got an electric mountain bike and it's, it's thrilling. It's really fun. Yeah. I think a lot of people are anti e-bikes, but it's like, it gets people out more. Yeah, I'm not going to go where they're not allowed. I respect the rules yeah. and, you know, especially land management rules, wilderness, that sort of thing. But mostly it's my townie lately and I'm just whipping around town yeah. and I'm more likely to hop on my bike and run an errand if if I don't have to pedal back up the hill to my house. Yeah, you yeah, know, like you go to the store on your bike instead of like getting in your car and using gas. I, I mountain bike a lot and I'm like exhausted, tired. And I'm I'm some guy is just like, I see him below me like, whizz, whizz. <laughs> yeah, and he passes me and I'm annoyed by it. Like, I'm like, oh, that's so sure. annoying. But I, I have to like push that aside. I'm like, it's really cool because this person is getting out on public lands and exercising. Like it's not, it's, it's not the same exercising if you don't pedal, but you're still exercising and you're getting out, getting outside. So like, it's like, I, I'm, I'm all for e-bikes. They do annoy me when they pass me. Cause I, I, I'm for whatever reason, I'm annoyed by it, but I get over it really quickly. Well, I'm better that than a dirt bike passing you. A lot of my friends and family dirt bike, and that's just never yeah. been my jam. But to do it silently is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Idaho weather went from 60s to 80s. Yeah, but does that mean does that make the river go from a thousand to nine thousand? Like that's did it, did it rain on the snowpack? That's usually a big bumper. I mean, wind too, but who knows? Um, launching Friday. Yeah, I mean, geez, Friday launch. It's gonna be. Half, yeah, half of Boise. When you so the Oahe, I don't know if you know this area very well. Go back to the map. Oh, hold on. There's the map. So it's not that far from Boise. You can see Boise is really close. Yeah. So this drive from Boise to Rome, I so I've driven it back to Boise after an Oahe trip on a Friday, and there's just a or like a Thursday or Friday. There is a steady stream of cars with boats going from Boise to, to the Oahe when it's when it's in, especially when it's high water like this and sunny. It's there's gonna be a lot of people on the Oahe this weekend. So there's no permitting for the private boater. Do you have to have permits as an outfitter for the Oahe? We have to have commercial permits as an outfitter. You have to get a permit, but it's self issue put in. It's not like you oh, don't yeah. have to do a lottery. Like as many, yeah. there's no limit to the number of people. So like this Friday, anybody launching this Friday or this weekend with half of Boise will the camping. There won't be camping. Like the, the canyon cannot handle all the people that are headed there and camping is going to be a major issue. Everyone tends to share in that circumstance. I assume, you know how that goes. I mean, yep. you know how that goes. Yeah. Let's go to this question. What's the best budget or setup figure I'm going to break or loose since I'm learning. So are utility Carlisle eight foot also white or paddler skinny eight foot also white or paddler skinny. Um, I don't know, like, um, I would, I would honestly just get good oars. Like you're going to buy some cheap oars and then a year later have to buy new expensive oars. I would just get the good oars now and just have good oar management. Don't use your downstream more. Like it's, if you're sideways to the river, you don't get to put your sideways oar in the river, your downstream oar in the river. You just don't get it. I know you want it, but you don't get it. You only get to use your, both your oars when you're facing downstream correctly. So do that, and you're not likely to break them. Um, you could, like, if you were to lose them, just tie them to your boat. I mean, that's that's one way. But if you wanted to go, I mean, I think Matt's onto something with the uh, um, the the dirt. So like Matt's idea is the um, let's see what the Magnum, uh, the cataract Magnums. Once you're in a system, you tend to stay in that system. So if you go cataract, you're probably going to stay in cataract. Cataract doesn't have a, a high level ore. They just have like mediocre level ore uh, where I think there's room to move up in, in the Sawyer personally. Um, if they're rowing that little paddle cat in the photo, I would say, you know, for one, a budget solution for a spare might be the Carlisle break in half or I like that in little boats because you can have each half on either side. Um, I've, not had to row with a spare that much in my life. And if they're just doing shorter trips or day trips with that little boat, I think that's a budget option. A lot of people do use the, um, 
the cataract shafts and the Carlisle blades as a mm. discount solution. And I, you know, what, what you can afford to get on the water for sure. There's, there's resale value to those. So you could start with those um, and then sell them for probably 75% of what you paid for them next year. As you get into the ore that you really want, or you learn you like um, if it gets you on the water this year, heck yeah, two cataract shafts, two Carlisle blades and a, a split in half Carlisle ore on the sides um, might be the cheapest option. I wouldn't row with Carlisle by, you know, uh, intentionally. On purpose. Yeah. Um, the the Sawyer also makes the polecat ore, which is less expensive. If you did a polecat ore with a, with a Duramax blade, which is like the plastic break blade that gets shrunk lights, that's an option with Sawyer um, to save some money. But um, I, I just like, I don't know. I just meet a lot of people who get into rowing. They buy a cheap setup and then a year later have to buy the expensive setup. And you're right. They can sell it, but they have to sell it. Yeah. Like, and so it's like, that's effort. So um, if you want a, a cheap setup, I think the Magnum with the, or the, the, all those options are fine. They're all, you know what I like for that little boat is Sawyer lights. I think those Sawyer lights, those laminates, a lot of drift boaters use. That's a wooden ore that they make. That's a little springy, oh, yeah. inflatable. But for a boat that small, you you're love your wooden oars, man. You, you <laughs> really do. love your wooden oars. I do, man. I um, I just found one of these um on the river the other day. Oh, did you? Cool. Yeah, there's there's not cheap though. I mean, it's still three hundred bucks. I mean, you yeah. could get the dyne lights for this that like, with the MXGs pretty much it's for the same price. The eight foot, so three hundred twelve bucks. But I I found one of these. It'd been. We were we were uh, setting safety on a rapid, and there was one that had been there for probably five years. It it was new and has kind of been beat down by being weathered. So you'll sell that one to T as their spare for one hundred and fifty, and then they just need to have another six hundred and twenty four in their set. Yeah, I would. I don't think anybody. <laughs> should, I mean, it would, yeah, I'd sell it as a spare. It needs it's it needs spare? some var, it needs some varnishing pretty bad. Oh yeah. But, um, God, I I I can't do wood anymore. I. I, I I know you love this, but I see can't I can't do, do the I can't even do the covered handle. I want I want to feel the wood in my hands. I, I like that raw handle. Um, they'll change someday. <laughs> I we were just talking to Marty Mac about this, who owns Sierra Mac in California, and I'm I'm selling a bunch of wood ores because I have tons of them. And the guides, my guides now choose the composites over the wood. There was a transition period where they were like 50-50. But now they're just all choosing composites and they don't want to use the wood orders. So I'm, mm. I'm selling them all and Marty's buying some of them. And I'm like, Marty, just <laughs> buy the composites, man. He's like, no, I love the wood. And it looks, it does have a cool look for sure. But he's so set on the wooden oars too. So they're having this conversation. Well, they look cool hanging on the wall too. They do look cool. That's what my Kenny, Kenny's oars, the blunt family ones. Yeah. I'm kind of saving to, to look on the wall. And I have, the original um, wood ores I used to use in California in my basement. I'm just saying that on the wall. I have uh, a Jimmy Snyder paddle oh, there. Yeah. Jimmy Snyder above the doorway. Sweet. Uh, Jimmy Snyder hanging by the door <laughs> over there. Uh, I, I am a collector. <laughs> and I've, been, I've started buying from Shade Tree Paddles in uh, Virginia and have one of his raft paddles and have a ducky paddle coming. And they're not Jim Snyder paddles. They're not Keith Backlund. They're probably as good as Kenny's, though. I mean, they're really nice. Um, I never got one from Kenny when I worked with him. I wish I had. I'm super lucky that I got a uh, that I, I got a a bent shaft paddle from him. Oh, that's I so cool! That. I love that. Is thing. it bamboo or is he did, did he use ash for the shaft? No, it was ash. It was a okay. it was a variety of woods. Um, I cool. what I forget. Um, let's look at ore shapes really quick. Um, so he's asking also wide or paddle or skinny i'm not sure what that exactly means i just standard is a good size and here's some different different blades there's a duramax it's 90 bucks it's you're gonna get shark bites but whatever um these other blades are nice i've used them in the past it's just this one right here the extra duty dyne light it's a lot more expensive but it's gonna last a long time in terms of shape like any of these shapes except for this this shoal cut one, they're all good. They're all good sizes. Whatever the standard Sawyer shape is, I think I'm, I'm super happy with it. I want a teardrop or a blade that's kind of more like the shoal cut dimensions, mm -hmm. but is a little more rounded and symmetrical. Um, I've been wanting to have someone make me something like that over the years. I've never thrown mm -hmm. down on it. But I think what he's referring to is Carlisle has a bigger, a wider or a skinnier option. 
And I've used the wide Carlisle blades um, on like a mini me before, or like boats where you just want all grab and you don't need that reach or whatever. And I kind of like a little wider blade, uh, but I think that's what he's referring to is the two okay. options Carlisle sells. So these, this is another option too. Um, Sawyer's making a shorter blade. Yeah. That's so, cool. So I, I mean, it's, you're going to let get less purchase with it, but it's a way to make your eight and a half foot or eight feet. You know, it's a way to downsize your aura a little bit if you need to. These Duralites, I tested one of the prototypes and I actively tried to break them. I, I attacked rocks with these things and I could not break it. So uh, for the price, this 155, I think these Duralites are where it's at. So, I mean, I actively beat these on rocks multiple, multiple times. I could not break them. So these Duralites are also, I think, pretty durable. It has Dura in there. The Dura, like, even though Dura is in the word Dura Max, I'm not going to say these are durable. So a good compromise, I think, might be these Dura lights. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you know any whitewater boaters that use shoal cut oars, or is it all just fishermen? Because I guess it could make sense. Low water. I like have that. seen some. Um, I've seen some. Yep. Yep. I'm. I'm not sure. I agree with it, but I've seen some people use them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use them, but that's just me. Okay, uh ground grand round is up. That's cool. I haven't really looked at flows. The pole cats for eight foot. Yeah, it's probably actually the way to go, the pole cats. Uh the Carlisles are three inches shorter. So for tiny cat, pole cat oars and magnum blades. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay, Maggie, you can't predict the Hawaii, but you can predict the Rogue. I, Maggie, I'm, I'm getting your question, but we might as well just get ahead to Maggie's question now that she's – I know she's here. We can answer hers. So Maggie's question – let's come back to – okay. Uh, have some friends um, – what are your thoughts about the current snowpack? Maggie, I've barely looked at the snowpack. I think it's only like 130% of average, so I don't think it's that crazy on the Rogue. The reservoir has been empty for a few years, so there's plenty of room in the reservoir to get water. I, and again, Maggie, I haven't looked at any of this. I haven't looked at the snowpack on the Rogue. I haven't looked at reservoir heights on the Rogue. But last I remember, the reservoir was almost empty, and the snowpack is not that crazy that I, I can't imagine it being above 5,000 CFS. Now, I say that now, and then it's going to snow for the next month, and it's going to be 10,000. You're going to be like, well, you told us 5,000. But like, I just can't even imagine it being high. It's possible, but that's my guess. So, yeah. I mean, what Maggie? What is this snowpack? I haven't even looked. The rogue is thirteen thousand right now. Yeah, that's pretty high. Um, yeah. Huh. Interesting. I haven't. I haven't even looked. The rogue is thirteen thousand right now. Ah. I get. I like. My best guess is it probably won't be above five. And 13,000 is a fun flow if you can – I don't – the Rogue is fine in the teens. I, it's like you have to be able to handle – manage high water stuff like tight boat spacing, look out for each other, all the stuff. But the Rogue in the teens is not that bad. Um, yeah. Actually, Matt, you should just have your own show and answer this question. I think you have a lot of insight here. We get it. Matt, we got to get you on the show, by the way. We haven't made that happen yet. Okay. So, okay, we answered Maggie's question. Maggie, if you have more questions, just ask them in the comments. I think hopefully I answered it. Uh, okay. Oh, back to the OI. There's more questions. Do you have any predictions what you think the flows will be the first week of May? I have no prediction on the Oahe River ever. I don't even, I don't, I don't see do tomorrow. Like, I don't even know what's going to do tomorrow. Runnable or unrunnable? It depends. I mean, depends on your skill level. Uh, if you're like a food food guide, you could probably handle it at 30,000 CFS. But if you're like a class three boater, your cutoff might be lower. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I don't, I don't predict Hawaii's ever. Okay, kids PFDs. What's your thoughts on putting a PFD over a heavy winter coat? We're planning on getting this one. Um, so it depends what you mean by a heavy winter coat. I'm assuming this is a, you're putting a PFD on a kid. 
I already have it in a 30 to 50 pen range, but it doesn't fit over her winter coat. I was considering the NRS Big Water U series, but it doesn't have a crotch strap. The 30 to 50 pounds we have seemed like a decent PFD. I like the flotation of Strictly in the chest and the pillow of the band of the head. Um, I, it just, the winter coat makes me nervous. Is it a winter coat that will take on water? Like, is it a down jacket or is it something that will weigh this kid down and make it harder for them to swim? So I don't think I would put a PFD over a heavy winter coat, but it depends what you mean by heavy winter coat. I just don't want it to absorb water if they swim and make it, make it really hard to pull them in and for them to make any progress while swimming. I think you're better with a form fitting fleece and then even a cheap splash jacket that doesn't breathe will add warmth, but yeah, yeah even as a synthetic, any kind of insulated coat's going to take on water. And I know people think, Oh, it's warm when wet. Cause that's what Columbia has told you over the years or whatever, but a, a soggy winter coat full of water is not going to help a kid. Yeah. My, my, I think they're thinking is how do I put a PFD on them and keep them warm in the boat? But you always have to think about what happens if they fall out of the boat. I know it's not likely. I don't know where you're going, when you're going, but like if they fall out of the boat, what's that coat going to do? And my guess is nothing good. The The best youth PFD, in my opinion, is the NRS Big Water 5. Like that's the best PFD for kids. Um, so, and it, it doesn't come with a cross strap, but I'm pretty sure it has little loops on it. I don't have one here. I don't think. But it has little loops you can attach a cross strap to, I think. I guess we should pull it up. I think the NRS 5 does. All of the adult ones do as well. What's it called? NRS Youth Type 5 PFD. Let's go to here. So let's go to – it's got to have – the big ones do for sure, but do the kids' ones. I bet I, so. I, I think so. I, I can remember using those. I don't see it though. Oh, there it is in the back. Oh, there's, so there's the back. That's yeah. the back loop. I think, yeah, right there is the front loop. Yeah. So they have the loops and then you can just, I mean, you can make your own strap, but like then there's, oh, we're trying not to use the word crotch strap, by the way. There's another name for it. <laughs> I forget what we're supposed to call it now, but we'll type in crotch strap and see what happens. Oh, leg straps. There we go. Leg straps. Leg so you straps. can just buy these leg straps for $11. So it doesn't come with the straps, but you can buy them there so first of all i'm going to say like it depends how much this kid weighs if they weigh 30 to 50 pounds you should put on a 30 to 50 pound pfd if they weigh 50 to 90 pounds you should put them in a 50 to 90 pound pfd so i would put them in the pfd based on the, their weight because the pfd is designed to for that weight so i would i wouldn't use a different pfd based on their weight to get them in a heavy coat i would may if you're worried about them getting cold on the overnight trip Maybe don't go. Like, maybe it's too cold. That's just my, what do you think, Rescue? Am I being harsh here? I see people looking for youth dry suits every year, and I don't even know what exists out there. It seems like something you could resell in a heartbeat if you could find something like that. It would have to have a relief zipper for a child, or it would be the worst day ever um, pulling over and helping them get in and out of it. Um, I think it depends on the weather. Yeah, if it's, if it's too cold to not have a thick coat on, I mean, that thick coat's for camp. I, I think, you know, multiple layers. I, I like the NRS splash jacket that was in that photo we just looked at because it doesn't breathe. That can add some warmth. Um, and because it's economical, but yeah, if, it, if wetsuit plus fleece plus splash gear isn't going to cut it, it's probably not a great trip for a little one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's look at rogue flows. I keep seeing. So you're seeing 11,294. I just Googled it. I, that's probably Agnes. And I believe that's with the, uh, the Illinois pumping in, which the Illinois I'm guessing is 6,000. So at Grants Pass, it's it was four thousand yesterday, and whatever's happening down there is causing it to go to six thousand. This what it's doing right now doesn't have any effect on what it's going to do at the end of May. So like, let's. I know you're probably looking at the flow, seeing like, oh man, it's going up. It, it it's because of some event happening right now. It's probably going to be five thousand at the end of May, but I could be wrong because it could. Who knows what could happen, but. Like it's unfortunately I can't predict the flows a month out. 
you could take this graph from the past 10 years, spread it out over your screen and look at 10 years of it and probably get some idea of what it's done in the past. That's what I use to guess flows in our guess the peak flow contest or to plan for some things, but it's, uh, it's a really big river. It's probably not that predictable, especially with dam releases. Yeah. And I didn't, I haven't looked at snowpacks yet, but I guess this is a chance to do it. The Hawaii's kicking is 240% of normal, which is pretty wow. big. Yeah, so that, that, that's probably – like it's very volatile right now. But if we go down to – this is right of the hood, Sandy the Hood River, Greenpoint. Ooh, look at that, 52% normal on Greenpoint. Um, and at least here, here in the Rockies – Oh, no, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. This is the time of year where these numbers start to really bounce to extremes and get skewed yeah. just because it's the time of year. Some years the snowpack has melted out. Someday, you know, you might look at that in, the, in a week and see 580% of the snowpack. That doesn't mean it's 580% of average overall. It is, it's for that day. And so as you move into the spring, sometimes those numbers can vary wildly and still have a fairly normal year. So water, to, it's interesting, there's snow water equivalent and year-to-day precipitation. So if we look at the Rogue right now, like it's 174 snow water, but that includes, for whatever reason, King Mountain is, you know, a lot, really high. And this Fish Lake is really high, which is, yeah, probably based on this time of year. I'm seeing a lot of hundreds. And then in terms of precipitation, we're 99% of normal. So... There's a lot of snow up there right now, but we're not, they didn't get hammered the precipitation. So it's I don't, just a little cooler spring up high, probably, which yeah. might mean you're just delaying the peak instead of making it bigger. And some late snow came and it just makes, it makes these numbers look big because it's been a cold, it's been a, a cold spring and we've had some late snow. But in reality, we haven't had that much precipitation in the rogue. So I don't, I, I think it's just going to be normal on the rogue. But again, I, that's just my first guess looking at this, but I haven't really analyzed it because I'm not super worried about high flows in the rogue. Um, especially with the reservoir being empty. Like it's been empty for a while. Huh. Yeah. And I can't, man, a kid's dry suit. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, California is legit this year. California is out of control. That if that was happening in on the rogue, I would like, if what was happening the Sierra is happening in the rogue, I would be worried about high level, but I'm not really worried about it right now. Uh, in regards to the kiddo in a winter coat, I would look at it like a large coat in a car seat. You don't do it. Enough force can cause the kid to come out of the car seat since straps may not be tight enough. That's interesting. Like if it's a big coat, that's an interesting. Thanks for sharing this, Jennifer. If it's if it's a big coat and the PFD is on top, it can't cinch down enough and the kid might come out of the coat. That's why the details of the code are so important. Like what kind of code are we talking about? Okay. Let's get back to this. So I think we got to that one. There's and if you're compressing right. the insulation of that coat to get the PFD tight enough, you're taking away its insulating value anyway. And the yeah. PFD is doing all the work. Yep. Okay. Air Mammoth. Have you seen this Air Mammoth before, Randy? Yeah, it's, it's so ugly, but I can't stop looking at it. <laughs> Okay, would you consider this to be the best of both worlds? Let me pull it up so everybody knows. This is like one side it's a raft, one side it's a cataract. And so let me see if I can, there we go. It's this thing. And the question is, would you consider this the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds? What is your take on the design? And do you think 20 inch tubes are too big for a raft? Man, I love big tubes, especially being tall. I don't like my knees up in my chest. I like big tubes. And big tubes power through things. Um, so I think this is a unique boat. I wouldn't have this be my only boat by any means. It's kind of cool. You could run it as a stern frame with paddlers. I like that. And I think you can run it as a paddle boat. I think it's a great way to power through things paddle boating i think it's it's really useful in my opinion if you're on a style of river where you're being aggressive we're forward paddling through things a lot so you're trying to power through big laterals power through big waves you know kind of like big water middle fork of the salmon um maybe north fork payette where it's a very aggressive forward style 
if you have to back paddle and spin like on technical rivers, I would not like this boat at all because those, the, the, the cat tubes are just going to hit rocks and things. And so it's, it's kind of a unique thing. If you, if you want a paddle boat through big water where you're being aggressive, I think it's great, but like you would never want this on Cherry Creek. This would be awful on Cherry Creek. This would be awful on low water Tuolumne. It would be the wind. I would not enjoy this on the wind unless the wind was really high and I was just forward paddling everything. So it's a, it's a tool that once in a while I, I wouldn't mind having, but I'm not sure I want a $5,000 tool. It's an air, so you can move the thwarts fore and aft, I assume. I, I don't like the yeah. idea of being a paddle guide in the back with a single foot cup and not a thwart to tuck in, but it looks, you probably can move them. Yeah, it seems you can. That's interesting, yeah. Having, getting a third thwart might be nice for a paddle guide. I never liked um, cats as much as round rafts because I, I like the impact of the front of the bow into the wave or over the wave. I like how the rocker connects with the wave and helps you climb over it. You know, a cat, it kind of washes under you. This seems like it hits the front thwart and it would have more propensity to stall than a cat, maybe less than a round raft. I don't know. It's, it's, I want to drive one right into some big hydraulic and see what it does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it looks, yeah. it looks like it, it wouldn't climb out like a cat and it wouldn't slide over like a raft. It, it, my gut tells me it would just bury into stuff. Like that's the first boat you'd see flipping a big hydraulic. Um, well, yeah. I don't think it's going to do well in big hydraulics, but I think it's going to do well breaking through laterals. So yeah. if I'm in the Grand Canyon and all I need to do is drive through some laterals to get like dr just forward paddle through laterals to get right or like, get right, just forward paddle. I think it would be pretty cool for that being aggressive, but I don't, I'm not choosing this to go through a hole like the lock saw. I bet this thing is awesome on the lock saw where you're just being aggressive. You're forward paddling a lot of stuff. It's not technical. Like that one big rapid on the Locksaw everybody talks about, Locksaw Falls. This is probably the ultimate thing to get a paddle out through Locksaw Falls. It's it's kind of an Idaho-centric design. I, I don't think anybody in California is going to use this. Because um, California, not this year, but generally has more technical whitewater. And I think this would do poorly in technical whitewater. I think for 5300 bucks, you could probably buy like a – a used mini max and a set of cat tubes and have a lot more <laughs> versatility in your fleet. Can tie webbing front to back on PFD. Interesting. Randy, what's your river ducky in Colorado? So I haven't run Foxton, um, but I spent a lot of years guiding on the pooter and I love the pooter and, uh, and the ducky. I paddle the Arkansas a lot in a ducky as well. Um, I like the sportier air duckies. I paddle the force. I've had several models of that force with the float bags over the years. Um, I do also have a Lynx with a front um, foot race that I like. Um, but on the Arkansas, I mean, I, I'll probably paddle the numbers class four section in a, in a uh, ducky 25 times in a season. Um, Brown's Canyon a handful of times. Um, I'll paddle Pine Creek on the Arkansas some, but usually at lower flows. It's, it's pretty tippy at the, at the more extreme end of that. Um, but, uh, gosh, maybe the pooter, just cause I spent so many years ducking the pooter. That's like a special place to me. Um, I am now in Idaho Springs, Colorado and working, um, right next to Clear Creek. And that's kind of a steeper, more technical, um, stretch of river. And I think it's going to be a ton of fun for the ducky too. Sweet. All right. I think we're getting close to done with the questions. Oh, we got to make, oh, sweet. I think that's it. Oh, back to 26 inch tubes. I think that could be really cool. I think that could be really cool. And by the way, like this is the guy who does, I'm pretty sure designed this boat is in this photo. This is one of the engineers guiding that boat right there in Colorado. So the thing about airboats that I really like is that the people that work there go boating and the boat designer actually is a boater. And so I'm sure it's really intelligently designed and, and serves a purpose. I just think it's a very specific purpose. How do you get back in with the 26 inch tubes? Would you run uh, thwart straps? <sighs> that's a good question. How do you, I think I'd yeah, run how do you, straps. that's the big question. How do you pull yourself in the sides of that boat or the front? I mean, it's not like your typical cat. You're not getting over that hump. Without yeah. something to grab. That's a good question. Maybe you're not. Maybe it depends on you having really good downstream safety and a good team that can help you get back in it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if the D rings are, are placed in the right spots for where you want your thwarts, or if you add more, which is kind of tricky Ooh. with airs, um, then, then you could run tight thwart straps. I know you guys have talked about that a little bit and that's, that's what I do for, with my paddle rafts. 
Um, and they are, you know, super, super Yeah, but tight. even with thwart straps, getting it over 26 inch tubes is no joke. Yeah, that's a real. lot of, that's a lot of tube to get over. I don't think most people, I think very few people could even do that. It's not just like one, two pull. It'd be like laddering up. You'd be like one, two, I'm, three, four, hand over hand. I'm pretty good at getting into boats, but I don't even know if I can get into 26 inch tubes. That's a really, that's a very astute observation, Rescue Randy. It's huge. Well, I'm, I'm shorter too. And, and it's harder to get back in the boat every year, you know? So that's, um, that's my biggest concern with it. The mammoth, the mammoth flats. Oh man, Matt, you got to read what you write before you type it. What's flats mean? Is that floats? It floats. The, the mammoth floats like a cat without floor touching. So that I, I can't even read this, Matt. Right. Oh, he's he's saying that the, the, the floor is suspended above the water line. And so uh -huh. it, it tracks like a cataract. Oh, okay. Just, just yeah, you should have said that. That makes it even weirder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it, it is kind of cool that it's a mesh floor. Like the one thing I, I, Sotar has been doing this. They've been putting mesh floors in mm -hmm. and, you know, for repair, like blowing a floor sucks. And so there, there's some really cool advantages to having a mesh floor. It's just, it costs less. Um, probably drains really fast and you know, blowing a floor is a bummer. So I kind of like the mesh floor, the track, you have to deal with the tracking, but I think you get used to it. 22 inch tubes in my wing feel like, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Big tubes are kind of like the cheat code. Like if you want to run hard rivers, having big tubes, it just goes through stuff really smooth. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of big tubes. So 26 inch tubes, I bet are pretty amazing. I bet that boat can power through some big stuff. Well, Randy, those are all of our questions. Do you have any things you want to bring up or things you want to talk about? Sure, a couple. I don't want to keep you all day, yeah. but uh, we've talked about it, my gear a little bit, and I wanted to show you a couple of things we've talked about on yeah. the show when I've been commenting. Yeah. I've got a few of my favorite things here. This is the flip line that I run the shock cord through. Mm -hmm. That's and the so, cat boats? Um, this is, this is my flip line that I wear around my waist. I've okay. taken it out of my PFD because I've just got too much stuff in there. And mm -hmm. I like the astral bag up there, which limits mm -hmm. what else I can carry. Um, but this goes around the waist and it stays nice and tight because of the, the stretch effect. So this is really uh -huh. snug. Um, even as I fluctuate throughout the season. Um, and so, you know, obviously two lockers, um, some people use one locker. I think they're easier to detach from each other in the chaos with, with two. Um, but this is just running quarter inch shock cord through tubular yeah. ribbing. And, and I, I may make sure I measure it carefully so that at maximum stretch, my shock cord doesn't break, but the webbing takes the weight. You know what I mean? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I like this for my, in West Virginia, when I guide, we don't usually use bow lines. Usually it's the guide's responsibility to have a tool yeah. for that. So I can just clip it to the boat and throw it around yep. the tree. And the, the stretch is just really nice. So this is something you can build for yourself. Mm -hmm. I usually, you know, get my rookies a bunch of cord and we'll build them together. Um, but that's kind of one of my favorite things that I use. That's inexpensive. And do you always lock, always lock those carabiners? Yeah. If they're on my body or, or outside of a bag, I do. Yeah. I don't always lock carabiners that are in a bag necessarily, but yeah. But like when I you put that around your waist, you're always locking those carabiners. I am. Yeah. I am. Cause I and just I think noticed when you did it, you didn't lock the carabiners, but I'm guessing that's just, <laughs> I'm not yeah, wearing it. It's just like, it, like, yeah, I just want to point that. That's like a kind of a crucial. I see people all the time yeah. with, with those things on that they, they have a non locker. Oh, or yeah, they just no don't way. lock the carabiners. And what an awful thing that would be to have the clip on something. Yeah, no, that's that's something I – and the more I learn about safety and the more I actually practice whitewater boating, the, the less I think some of those things are likely to happen. I don't freak out as much when I see a non-locking carabiner on a water bottle these days, but I don't practice that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's um, hard to point out every time you see it. I don't yeah. freak out, but I'm sometimes I'm like, eh, I don't want to freak out every time. But non-locking carabiners on your body. Um, if you, I've watched a few videos of people getting their non-lockers clipped onto something in a boat yeah. and you know, almost flipping, and yeah. it's terrifying. And I think people think like I don't think people hear that it's it, like a lot of people. We we probably assume everybody's heard that having non-locking carabiners is okay, but I see non-lockers or people having a locker that's not locked on their PFD so often that I don't think the word is out. Yeah, I agree. And and I've seen it more out east. I've seen it a lot on the golly, all these guys with like old school ovals, uh, yeah. no locker on them. I, I've also seen young guys like really get after their guest for the non-locker, like not for climbing carabiner on their water bottle. Yeah. I don't sweat those as much anymore, especially if it's my guests and it's not the hardest water or whatever. I What I do if I, that happens, 
it is I'll spin them around. So at least the, the gate is facing away. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. Um, cool. This is the downriver throw bag I was telling you guys about. Mm -hmm. um, this is the name patch I put on a lot of my gear. Because <laughs> you can buy them on Amazon for like $3.99 and they're that's iron cool. on. And I, I put a little aqua seal actually to stick them to things. Uh -huh. I've got one of my PFD as well. And um, my clientele know my name. You know, they remember my name. They, cool. they shout me out on TripAdvisor. They tell my boss they had a great trip or whatever. But um, when everyone has a black green jacket at the outpost, that can be a nice way. We've all seen how ghetto it looks when you use a Sharpie on a PFD and then it gets wet or, or on a throw yeah. bag and it gets all, you know, diffused. But yeah, this is the, the kit where I'm carrying. I'm the guy that carries the rescue gear on top of the bag. Nice. Um, now I do carry the chest bag that that astral. Oh, the astral. Bag, yeah, right? the 30, It's like thirty and feet, thirty-five it's, feet. I think it's thirty-five feet. Yeah. Um, it's, how, often, I'm like how, often do you, how often do you use it? A few times a season. Yeah, it sucks um, to stuff that one. That yeah, one's it, not it, fun it to does. stuff. It does, but I've also never really worried about the stuffing time. If I'm critically running downstream, I'm either going to abandon it on shore or I'm going to quickly coil, knot it, throw it, and go. You know why um, the stuffing actually, time matters? I think hmm. because you don't people don't practice because stuffing sucks right and so you i i i'm realizing to get people to practice more you want to throw back you probably don't practice with it much because you're like oh i gotta stuff this stupid thing right or if it's stuffed okay. easy you practice with it more well and easy to stuff is certainly nice I, I think that the actual time when you're stuffing a bag with during a river emergency usually that's it's inconsequential back to shore and it's it's it, it is inconsequential it's, I it's see inconsequential more but practice is an issue too yeah like I've been telling you, I see so many people throw a throw bag when they have them for six months and it's, it's not pretty. Yeah. And so like practice is actually an important part of being a whitewater boater. And so having a throw bag that encourages you to practice, I think is a good thing. Yeah. And if it's more fun in camp to, you know, each throw to see who throws better and then see who stuffs faster, that's just, that's a fun added bonus to the game. I, I just don't think it's the most important skill. Um, this bag I use with 120 feet. Um, so I can pull out a big old handful, like half mm -hmm. of it and throw if I need to, mm -hmm. I'm probably more likely to throw this to somebody who's already on a rock or something like that. And yeah, I can't throw it a hundred feet. Mm -hmm. Um, but we can deploy it a hundred feet using other methods, a kayak, yeah. a ducky, something like that. So this is my rescue line. Um, generally, if I'm guiding a commercial trip, we've got guests, we've got 14 foot boats. I'm going to have a company static line as well. Mm -hmm. But when I'm out in my max 12 or my duckies, this is in my watershed. Um, and it's just my general rescue kit, you know, and, and I'm using it. You said it's a hundred feet, 120 feet. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like 5,000 pound rope. I think it's the grab line or whatever. Um, got is it blue water or there. is it blue water or sterling rope? I, think I don't remember I think if it's blue water or sterling. It looks like blue water rope I, from the tracer. It looks like yeah, green. That's blue. Yeah. That's it's green. The tracer's green. Well, the tracer's green. The, the rope is yellow. Yeah. I think that's blue. I'm pretty sure that's blue water rope. Okay. And, and I don't know if it's 40, 400 or 50, 200. I, I'm pretty casual about that. I told the guys at Downriver, I want some 5,000 foot or 5,000 pound rope. Yeah. Um, I think to use 5,000 pounds in most of the circumstances I'm out, even if we had a huge five to one mechanical advantage, that's a lot of humans, more than I'm usually out there with. Um, so, you know, 4,000 pounds is nearing the carabiner strength and a lot of other parts of the system. It's exceeding the pressic strength. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with that as my rescue rope. I've told I think it's folks, this rope right here. Well, this is seven sixteenth diameter. I'm not sure if yours is the same. I think mine's bigger than so. Maybe, maybe no. Mine might be the seven sixteenth. Is that the tracer looks the same? Yeah, it does. It does. This is breaking strength five thousand. Oh no, the tracer is a little different. This has these little tickings to it. Hmm. And this is mine are definitely green. Where what I see on yours is blue. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll check it out. It might be sterling. It's got a good sheath to it, like pretty grabbable. The thing I love about this bag is that the knot is on the inside. Yeah. Just adding two grommets to these things has really tightened that up for me. I've got mm -hmm. enough for a finger, a carabiner, um, but nothing else. I, th I mean, I think it should be standard. That, that oh, yeah. like all throwbacks should have that same little loop at the end. Like this is so dated, this dangly. Oh, that whole thing. Yeah, I hate that. It's ridiculous. How easy would it be to fix this? NRS could just put a second grommet in there, throw a loop in and not have it dangly. Yeah, but, an owner could put a second grommet in themselves probably too. I think a plastic or, grommet would be fine. Or just buy a better throw bag. <laughs> yeah, agreed. <laughs> buy, the buy, one that, thing, buy that one. The one thing I know you don't like about this particular one is, is this thing, right? And we've all seen these. Um, my practice is just a quick slip knot at the top whenever I do that. And that just kind of shrinks that up. Um, anyone can grab this. Oh, I don't. I don't hold. mind those that much. Like these long thingies. I don't mind them. It's, yeah. Unless unless they're a loop. 
So when you buy this from NRS, these are tied together. Oh so, yeah. So your hand can fit in there. Like it's when you could, they could just separate them. And I might've cut this. I don't remember if I did. Yeah. When they um, come, when they come as like a loop yeah, that has an entrapment when there's no, re like the odds of an entrapment are super low. Right. But like, why not just cut that and do that to begin with? So I think that my whole thing is when they're, when this forms an extra loop, that's a potential hazard. Yeah. Agreed. I don't agreed. mind that these are long that much. I like clean and simple. I mean, I, I don't use an extra carabiner to rig this in the boat. I have, I can't remember seeing a fast, a fast X buckle break at work, right? We use them on PFDs every day. We trust them for a lot of things. I'm I've comfortable had, with this. I've had a lot of fast X buckles on break on throw bags. On throw bags you have. Yep. Now, are they always to the interior of your boat the way you and your guides rig them? Cause I don't like to see them hanging off the back of the boat. Well, so we mostly do overnight trips. And right, so, so they're, they're on the frame. Usually, they're usually hanging off of a frame. Right. Um, or they we don't hang them off the back of a boat. They're inside the boat, yeah. But I, I've just – I like, whether they break, like, low – like, they can break a million places. But it, we can just replace them. Like, a sure. fast, a fast like, buckle is something you can buy. When when it's this one, it's easy because it's you just replace this. When it's this one, it requires me taking it to somebody to sew. But I, I replace, like, two or three fast S buckles a year to break on throw bags. I did have a swimmer once and this had migrated to the perimeter line somehow slid a little bit when we were, mm -hmm. you know, hitting waves. And I did have a swimmer once grab the fast X buckle and him and the, and the throw bag went away. Um, mm -hmm. And we recovered the swimmer. I couldn't find my closed throw bag. I ended up doing like two or three trips down that section immediately hunting for it, even though I knew it was closed and uh, finally a friend recovered it. Um, but so that's, that's something to say about these is if you do grab them, they can pop open. Um, but if it's toward the interior yeah. of the boat, not that likely. And if it's, if it's closed properly, I, I don't think it's going to deploy if it ends up in the water and it's probably. Gonna yeah. Float yeah. Invisible. Yeah. I'm not super worried about deploying. Um, so, oh, I'll show you my other favorite piece of gear. Well, let's go back. Let's go back oh, to yeah. your, let's go back to that throw bag. And your oh yeah, sure, sure. Bag. So oh, my have, I'm going to grab it. If you have a swimmer, I don't think it's to hurt me, but if you have a swimmer, 40 feet away what do you do um if i have a swimmer 40 feet away if i'm on a river big enough where i'm going to have a swimmer 40 feet away i'm going to have quick access to this bag if i get out of my boat and i'm setting safety um and and i'm going to be kind of set up for a swimmer mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm the lead boat i'm going to eddy out at the bottom of the rapid mm -hmm. i'm going to have the big bag in my hand Got it. and if i start to see carnage i'm going to set myself up far enough downstream that i have some real reaction time i.e pull my press and stuff out and be ready to throw that big bag. And what, what are the, what's the, <coughs> let's get back to the swimmers for a sec, but yeah. like, what is that? Is it like two press six, three pulleys and some carabiners? Is that what you got in there? It's I think 25 feet of tube webbing. Okay. One strand or two? One strand. Okay. Um, but I also have the thing around my waist, which I replace yep. pretty much seasonally. So I trust cool. its strength yep. too. That's a good anchor around a tree or whatever. Um, press six, I'm doing two auto blocks, yep. one hollow block these days. Um, most of my systems would only use two of these devices, but it's the mm -hmm. weakest part of the system. And sometimes I like to clip one of these just to the uh, branch of the tree where I'm setting up my system or, you know, to organize gear or something mm -hmm. during a, a rescue. I've done that more during classes than realistically. Mm -hmm. um, in here, I'm carrying four lockers. Mm -hmm. My opinion is pretty much any locker is a good locker. I know that there's some that are stronger, that are some are higher, higher quality, but they're pretty much the strongest part of my system. So I'm not too worried about those. I know there's better pulleys, but in the years I've been carrying these, I've really only utilized them twice, uh, the SMC micros. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I just go carabiners first. When I build a quick Z-drag, the pin isn't that bad, but we haven't been able to get it off with human strength. I'll mm -hmm. just go rope through carabiners, beaner, 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 get a Z mm -hmm. or another redirect, and just get a bunch of people to yank on it. And I know we're only upping mechanical advantage. I think know, that percent. works for paddle boats. I yeah. think – People who are watching, just if you're running gear boats, you need more firepower than that. Like, yeah, th these techniques work for like smaller scale things, not like the big old gear boat pins. Yeah, and that's the difference between our worlds a little bit. Is I'm yeah. running 13 foot paddle boats frequently, and I'm private boating with a smaller raft or duckies. Yeah, and so for me, like I have pulled my ducky off with mechanical advantage with this little astral bag. Yeah, um, you know, you wouldn't rely on that for most things, but 1800 pounds. If I'm ducking it, with I mean, it's, friends, it, it has know? spectral rope in it, so it's good rope in there. Yeah, it, it is. It is, and, it, and it's useful. And so when I carry this on my chest in my PFD, mm -hmm. um, I like this in the Astral. I haven't quite figured out a good way to carry it with my NRS Big Water Guide that I like to wear at higher water, mm -hmm. um, that higher float. But I can't have much else going on up here. So right? first, so I'm gonna, first, let me just start here. I'm going to try to talk you out of the Astral. <laughs> yeah. 
because for a number of reasons, one, it doesn't have distance Two, it's thin rope. It's hard to grab for both the swimmer and the puller in. So like if I'm setting safety with that, I guess you bring your other rope, but I'm going to tell you with either rope, you're not going to like accuracy, at like 40, 50 feet. You can't do the astral can't do it more than 30 anyway. Right. And the other rope, you, your accuracy at 40 or 50 feet is going to be pretty weak. And so, and, and then all, the other thing is like the astral throw bag here is it, it bulks at your chest and this, this may work for you. Oh, great. I, I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm trying to change your mind a little bit, <laughs> but for the average person, the most important thing they can do for one of the most important things they can do for self-rescue is get themselves back in a boat. So you want to minimize your, your frontal like stuff. Right. And so that, that, that throw bag right there makes your PFD stick out farther. So it's harder to get back in the boat. And so for people that are struggling getting back in the boat, I'm not going to want them to put a, a throw bag in their chest. I want to take away every barrier to them getting back in the boat that I can. So, so I don't like it there personally. And when you're, as soon as you outlast the, the distance of that astral, there's a whole, like, it's hard to be accurate at high distances at the 40, 50, even 60 foot range. So I'm going to suggest killing the astral and going with the waist belt. I just don't I, like them. I've worn, them. I've worn them. That's how I started. Get a good one. You know, and so now I'd have my waist belt and my flip line. And of course, I could bring my flip line back up here because I'm getting rid of this. Um, that's why I don't carry my flip line up here anymore. Um, I've got a pretty slim knife on the inside with a, a retaining um, shot cord on it. Uh, Spyderco Atlantic Salt. I love that knife. Great knife. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something you will like. You put them on the, the thwart too, right? You can put them on the thwart. This is the 15 meter bag. Yeah. So it's not that it's not that bulky, and the way that the waist belt on this bag, and so th like I'm selling these, so like just like very pretty clear, like I'm giving a sales pitch or something that I do sell. So I'm not like I, I have a vested interest here, but I have a vest, a vest interest because I was not a waist belt guy either for a long time, mm -hmm. and like I thought they were stupid. I hated wearing them, and I I tried these out, and I don't mind them. Like actually, I, I kind of like how accessible they are. Yeah. And so this one is pretty small, like surprisingly small around your waist. And so I don't really notice it that much. Here it is on my waist right here, a video of it. It isn't that big. Yeah. There are, and, and, the, and a lot of the waist belts are like floppy. They're always like flopping up and down, flopping or annoying. This one doesn't really flop. So I'm just gonna tell you, I, I bet you if you tried this, this throw bag out, I could change, if, I could change your mind. I don't just think having, I'd like it in the ducky because I use the inflated back brace. You know what I mean? Oh, the ducky is a different thing. I don't like, like I don't wear a kayaking. But for me, I, I ducky a lot and I raft a lot and I want kind of the same system because I want to, it's used to be instinctive. You know okay, what I mean? That, like that makes sense. that's my, that's my routine. I can say that the day I throw this to somebody and I can't reach them with it is the day I'll reconsider, but it hasn't really happened yet. Don't, I, I back, why would you wait for that sure. day? <laughs> why, okay. Well, someday when I mess up, why would you wait until then? I would just like, anyway, so here's the other well, thing this, this thing has, I'll just show you. I don't use this thing, but there's a little flip line pouch that you can oh, add on huh. to the belt and you start looking like Batman. So I'm not a fan yeah. personally, but that is an option to throw a pouch on the side. That's like a pretty accessible pouch for like a flip line to switch in that method. So like, I know I'm not going to change your mind, but like I am so sold on the flip line of the PFD now. Like I yeah. am so sold because it's, it's, it's quick access. It's right there. Um, it's, it can't snag, although yours is tight. So yours, is, I'm sure you're, you have a plan for it, but man, the waist belts for like guiding and rafting, I am, I'm a convert. And I was, dude, we're, we're like, I was, I used to love wood oars. I used to love my <laughs> yeah. waist belt thing. I used to um, think waist. I used to, I, my my flip line used to be around my waist. I used to think waist belt throwbacks were terrible, and I have slowly converted on those things. Yeah, so, I'll try one. Um, I, I'm going to be training some rookie raft guides this year, and uh, certainly a couple of them are going to have one on. I'll, I'll try one for a day and see, and try it for throwback practice. Um, I mean, we've but, been crushing out throwback practice. I we do. I was doing five, ten throwback tosses a day this past month with all nice. different throwbacks. Nice. Like I've, I've tried them all and I, I have a lot of information and watching other people do it and getting feedback from people, what they like, what they don't like. And so like, I'm very educated at this moment on what throwbacks throw well and what don't. This throwback is the last one anybody picks. This thing is awful. Yeah. Any floppy bag like this isn't fun. Um, those throwbacks I sell zing out. The Coca-Tat Huck, yeah. the 70 footer, 
That's a good bag. If I'm going for a 60 foot throw, that is the only bag I want at 60 feet. Yeah. Like it's even better than like the, like for me throwing, not the only bag I want, like throwing this, the 60 foot version of like, there's a, um, this, this rope's just a little bit thicker. So if I had the 20 meter, that one's 20 meters, 71 feet, I believe. Is that right? No, no. 69 feet, 69 feet. If I'm throwing from 60 feet, this will make the distance, but the huck is just a little bit lighter to make that distance easier. Mm. So like in terms of accuracy and, and like making throws, like these new bags are really sweet. I'm, I'm a definite convert. I could, if you came out here and threw bags with us, I could, I, I'm sure you'd be convinced. I think a big part of the difference too is the geography we work in. You know, like mm -hmm. if I'm setting up safety below Pine Creek Rapid on the Arkansas little class mm -hmm. five section, it's not 30 feet across the river. You know, oh, a lot yeah. of the places I run. About 30 um, feet works for you. Rocky Shoals, you know, the swift yeah. current running through narrower stretches. Most of the stuff I'm running in Colorado, at least, um, I like that. I also like this. And, and would you ever throw the bag from a boat? Everyone says, no, no, no. no. I have on the New River Gorge where it's like mm -hmm. an ocean out there. And actually, yeah. I like this for bag from the boat. I actually have pulled someone away from the meat grinder, a big feature uh, in the Keeney's Rapid on the New River Gorge yeah. bag from the boat. And uh, I was a trainee and the, the senior guide was like, I never would have thought to do that, but you kept them out of danger. And uh, like, so I'm not averse to throwing this from the boat out on the golly or out on the new or some of these bigger water places I run. I prob I may never do it again. Um, it's circumstantial, but I, I could. And, and having that quick access. I also like the little shorter rope for just kind of general use stuff. I don't really use my rope as a, uh, a drying line or anything like that, but to tie up a boat in camp or at lunch or something like that. Sometimes a little less length is nice. Sometimes a little lower price is nice too. You know, this is something yeah. I can wear out and I can replace every couple of seasons instead of feeling like I have to hold it for five or 10 years. Getting back to practicing, the shorter your rope is, the more likely you are to practice because it, it goes oh, yeah. to stuffing time. So like yeah. if I have to stuff a 75 foot bag, I'm less likely to restuff that than a 50 foot bag. So for having sure. a, like we having a 50 foot rope or a 60 foot rope, the shorter than a traditional 75, it is easy to stuff. It's just not as much of a pain to stuff it. So you will go practice right. more. So like there's something to be said for shorter ropes in terms of you practice, like you're more likely to practice with a shorter rope. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm like wider with this thing. I mean, it's quick to grab. I mean, it's just right there. Um, a lot of my job is with a lot of guides, my junior, um, when I run a trip, I'm, eddying out after whatever the big rapid is. And I'm just, I'm literally having my guests hold the boat and I'm grabbing this bag and I'm heading to the edge yeah. and, you know, then I'm getting back in the boat and passing the boats and heading downstream. Um, but for me, the convenience of, of frequently being the one with the bag in hand on shore and just knowing I can have this now I've got the big one too. Um, but if I'm at the bottom of zoom flume on the Arkansas river and it's 32 feet across the river, probably and the currents in the middle, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable having this as my rescue tool. And it's so fast to just recoil and throw again. You know, for that yeah, second yeah. row. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I hear you on that. I'm not saying restuff in the real world. I'm saying restuff so you practice more. For practice, for sure, for sure. Because and, and I am an advocate of practice. I people yeah. suck unless they practice. Yeah, and there's a lot of people with more up here than me. You know what I mean? A lot yeah. of humans have a harder time climbing in the boat because they have more mass up here. Um, for me, it doesn't really inhibit it, but I actually do kind of account for it with my technique. So I'm climbing back into the boat, and as I'm kind of doing the dolphin kick, I kind of bring my chest up yeah. over it but that can vary depending on the pfd too and i think with the astral product i mean it's it's not too bulky up here i mean i'd like that if they had a little more flotation already um if this was in the chest of a high float i think it might even be bigger and more and too much you know with yeah. the thickness of like that nrs foam um but but i love it so you know i like to be able to go out with a simple kit and so that's why i've got 120 feet in the other bag it, it's a system where i agree neither is perfect but combined, it gives me a really good setup yeah. for rescues and retrievals and, and just diversity. You know what I mean? And I, I think an important thing, I just want to like, you have a system that works for you based on your knowledge, your, where you, where you run trips, the type of stuff you do. That's well thought out. And I love that. Like, that's great. Um, I like, I'm hesitant to recommend this to other people for different yeah. reasons. Like you, you've thought it through, like, and this is where like judgment is so important. Like if you understand, if people understand the why they're doing things and can explain it and like have good reasons, it's awesome. Do your thing. But like what happens is then other people do it and it's not right for them. Like if yeah. somebody's, if somebody can't get in the boat or they they have a hard time getting the boat, they need to, they don't want to need more stuff up here. No, right? they need to buy a PFD that suits them for that too. Yeah. Or if they forget no. to grab their throw bag, 
when they go scout, well, you know what I mean? Like then, or like the big bag or whatever, like if you're saying safety, like not like everybody has a different reason for doing things. It's like, that's why I like talking through the reasoning so yeah. people can make decisions based on their own, their own needs and, and where they're working. Yeah. And, and for the guides that I train, um, 50 foot ropes are my recommendation at a minimum. That's our trip leader requirement in Colorado. So when they mm. become a trip leader, their equipment is legal for, for the trip. You know, we have to have those on the trips. Um, I don't re recommend that they necessarily carry it on their body. I, I think first year raft guides are fine to just have it in the boat. Maybe they'll forget to take it when they go to scout, but the first year guide's probably not the one in the front of the trip setting safety. And if they've just had a swim, I, I don't think they're likely to rush to shore and be the rescuer too. You know, like if, if they've landed their boat, Mm -hmm. um, then they can grab it. It's right in front of them. It's on the flip line or on the strap on the boat. Um, but the realistic, you know, potential of somebody like having a swim themselves and then getting to shore and then b bagging other people. I, I don't know that it's that realistic. If, if a young guide is going to buy one bag, I think somewhere in the middle is a good choice, at least for the rivers we run 50 to 60 feet clipped into the boat is fine by me. Yeah. Um, that's, but, I mean, that's on our trips. That was what we run. We run like a, a 65 foot, we, we just provide our bags for guides and yeah, they clip cool. in the boat. I'm, I'm super happy with that. I'm with you. Like I, I hear you. Some of our guides who like are a little higher standard also carry a, a waist belt. Right. So like, I don't require it, but like we train on it and we like the people who were like, Hey, I really want to be at a higher level and be guiding harder stuff. Those ones tend to wear the waist belt. Yeah. I mean, I gotta show you the throwback that I'm actually really enamored with right now. Do you know you're in Colorado? Do you know River Station, that company? River Station? I don't. It's a so it's a Colorado company. I'm gonna say I am like I was looking for a new bag to tie into a boat, mm -hmm. and I found this website and I bought one, and I'm pretty stoked on their stuff. I bought I like this the one, the boat. This is a color. It's some guides in Colorado, and so I bought one of these. It's way better than the NRS. This this one that nobody should ever buy for any good reason. This bag here. The, the NRS has better sterling rope, so you're getting better rope with this, but this rope's great. And it's a great bag. I'm, I'm pretty stoked on this one, but they just came out with a less of its expensive version, the um, the Compact 60. And oh, that's a good style. It's a good style. It's a good size. It's only 60 bucks. It's 60 feet of rope. Two grommets on the bottom. Yeah, it's the whole thing. It's got yeah. all, the, all the things you would want in a good throw bag. Um, it's good rope. It's not like the best rope, but it's good rope. Um, and so like it's budget friendly made in Colorado. Like I've been throwing this one. I just ordered two of them cause I was curious and if it, it's, it's it throws really nice overhand. You can throw it underhand too, but like your hand fits like a football. It's like a football. Yeah. This is a great bag. This is, that's a good product. I like the all Cordura kind of concept yep. too. You know, I, I don't think the mesh really matters that much. It doesn't. I think it's just something to degrade in the sun and break down over time. And I've seen that. Um, is there an about the owners or something? I wonder who this is. Um, Arc guides. I saw the Jody. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm, mm. I really like their stuff. Um, I follow them on social media. They have some great cool. blog. They put some great blog posts out recently. I don't know. I'm, I like, I don't get any discount. I pay full price for everything. I don't didn't even ask them for a proteal. I don't support Oh, mom and pop shop. Absolutely. I might buy but one like, to support them. I'm like, hey, these are like good people making a good product. They're thinking about things. I am like super supportive of what they're doing. That's cool. I always have a few freebies I toss out to my young guides during like like trivia night or whatever. This might be a good one to, this to is get a, in the hands of a new guy. This is a great bag for like that person just leaves it clipped in the boat. It's just a good all around bag. Yeah. Yeah, for, for the person that leaves it clipped in the boat. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's on you if you run to the scene and you forgot your rope. Um, I don't think I would do that, though, run to the scene and not grab your rope. Like, it's just you grab your rope and you go. Um, so it, it depends on the individual. If you're forgetful in moments of chaos, maybe having a bag attached to your body is good. Um, if you're the only boat on the trip and you're in a place where you might have some carnage and people might all swim, maybe you would be a swimmer and a rescuer, too. You know, but... Uh, I think for most people, one bag in the boat is, is fine. And if it's, if it's that rope, it's probably not your pin kit, you know, but it's probably a throw rope. That rope I could probably pull off a light paddle boat, but it's not yeah. going to pull off a gear boat. Like it's, I could probably use it to pull or maybe to get it, throw it over to get us a, a line over. Yeah. Um, 
I'd yeah. three point to anchor it on a boat. So it's doubled over and with the right knot tied, it, it does in essence, double its strength um, for pulling. So you, there are ways to rig a, a, a loop. Um, so it's stronger and that rope is long enough to do that. So you could probably get a, a three point anchor on a boat um, where you've got it doubled over and tie the right big, you know, the huge over um, overhand or figure eight. Uh, and that does essentially double a rope strength. I've done that with this on a boat, a uh, three point anchor. Now you're not running it individual strands through the D rings. You have to tie it as a loop. I know what you're talking those about those doubles, right? Yeah. But that works. And and if you're practiced with it, you can do it pretty quick. That can get you another ten feet off the boat and a really good anchor on the boat. Okay, I gotta go because I'm going kayaking right now. I just realized <laughs> good, it's go kayaking. Um, Matt, good point. I I I don't know. I I, I think I'd rather have like I, I if somebody's gonna rescue me, of course I want them to have a waist belt bag, but. I can see both sides of this. I, and I don't always want to wear a waist belt. I don't know if you wear a waist belt or not, Matt. But Randy, thanks for joining the show. I'm sure we have thanks more to talk me. about. So we'll have to get you back on. Thanks for reaching cool. out. Thanks for all your help in entertaining the masses. Uh, Where are masses? How many people attended live today? Uh, we, I don't know. We had 34 people on at one point. Cool. I get a cool. number up there. So. That's yeah, awesome. Not bad. I'm glad to be glad to be famous like you. Uh, a one <laughs> one one other topic yeah. for people to think about. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm doing something a little bit uh, out of the box today, a little bit wild, something most people wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. I am thwart swapping. I've got a Max 12 and it's green, and I'm swapping all three thwarts with someone with a white one for a little funk and flair. Oh, cool. So for boat That's style, fun. I think it's kind of fun. Sweet. Cool. All right, I got to go. Thanks for joining. Thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you guys on Friday. We're back on our Friday show. Uh, Aaron's back in town too. All right. Thank you.